All right, commanders. What I'm about to show you is probably going to become the new meta for planetary port defense operations, at least against Cyclops interceptors. I call this build the Thunder Hammer, in reference to a weapon from Warhammer 40k that was very effective at destroying Tyranids and other groups of enemies. Basically, picture a gravity hammer from Halo, with the power level dialed way up. The Thunder Hammer is a close-range anaconda build that leverages a 6 mod shard mag dump to insta-gib Cyclops interceptors repeatedly and reliably when configured correctly. This build pushes the anaconda to its absolute limit, and is one of the few ships with the physical hardpoint space and thermal capacity to make this work. It will still run extremely hot, and require a complex understanding of power management, heat management, and in-flight repair systems to operate effectively. The Thunder Hammer is a highly specialized build with a singular focus on low-level interceptor combat. While it is capable of hunting scouts, I would compare this use to hunting rats with a 12-gauge turkey load. Also note that this build is much less effective against higher-level interceptors, and will definitely need help securing kills against Medusa and Hydra variants. Our armor configuration will be AXI standard, military-grade composites with heavy-duty engineering and deep plating experimental effects. This gives us an excellent defensive foundation to deal with Thargoid energy and caustic weapons. Running lightweight armor isn't helpful here, since basically nothing will make the Anaconda fast enough to escape a lopsided engagement. We will be leaning hard into durability across the board, with some give for support capabilities. Since Guardian weapons all carry exceptionally high power draw, and since we will be running six of them, an armored reactor lacks the necessary output to drive all the onboard systems. That leaves an 8A overcharged or Guardian reactor as possible options. Either solution can work, but I find the Guardian reactor preferable, since it offers a higher integrity and needs no engineering. Higher integrity and lower module heat are going to be a common target on this build. We will be overheating internal systems on a regular basis during the firing process, so we want to make sure they can withstand some extreme conditions. This includes our thrusters, which leverage a 7A package, with a drive strengthening blueprint and thermal spread experimental effect. We abandon all pretense of speed and maneuverability in exchange for greater resilience and lower thruster heat. It will take longer to get around the battlefield, but this also presents an opportunity to repair key systems during flight. Our frameshift drive is 6B shielded with the thermal spread experimental effect, once again reducing cost, increasing resilience, and reducing thermal load, particularly when spooling for a high wake, as this will be one of our few options for retreat. Our 5A life support is reinforced. I've opted for A-rated here because this core module does not follow the usual rule when it comes to module rating. The A-rated variant actually has more integrity than the B-rated one, in addition to having more emergency air. Our weapons package will draw a lot of power from the reactor, but won't load up the power distributor much, so we don't actually need charge-enhanced or weapon-focused blueprints on this build. A stock 8A power distributor will have just enough power to empty the magazine of each weapon we're going to fit. And since we're running shieldless, we're going to maximize module endurance with the shielded blueprint. Experimental effects can be double braced or flow control. I've opted for flow control to help manage power demand on the reactor. This is especially helpful because power distributor malfunctions will greatly impede our ability to fire when we need to. We will only have enough distributor power to fire when the weapon capacitor is fully charged. Anything we can do to make that happen consistently is of direct material benefit. Not only does the shielded blueprint give us this reliability, it also reduces our power draw by more than 20%, helping with heat load and power management. The sensor package is 8A long range engineered. Since we are slower than a typical AX ship, we want to be able to see threats coming from farther away. Positioning is important with the Anaconda, since it lacks the raw maneuvering power of the Corvette, and the speed of the Cutter. The 5C fuel tank is left unchanged. For optional internals, I elected to mix in support equipment, since natural use of this ship will involve longer flights between targets. 
Commanders interested in maximum resilience can swap out any support module for more hull or module reinforcements. Here I've sacrificed some defensive resilience for more repair capability, both of the hull and internal modules. The size 7A Universal Limpet Controller is an absolute beast of a support unit. Only a handful of ships have the room for it, and the Anaconda is one of them. This enables strong supporting functionality when fighting as part of a wing, with solid hull repair rates when fighting solo. A cargo rack is required any time a limpet controller is fitted. The 6E rack provides space for 64 tons of limpets and the possibility to recover escape pods and tissue samples during combat. Fighter hangers are strongly discouraged in group engagements because of the massive negative impact they have on network performance. This fighter is here for solo play, where it acts as a useful distraction for attacking scout ships. This type of combat is also a great way to rank up underleveled NPC pilots. It can be replaced with a hull or module reinforcement if desired. The 6A Field Maintenance Unit helps keep our weapon systems operating at full power, since overheats are a regular occurrence with this ship, and since Guardian weapons are very vulnerable to damage from overheating, this module will help ensure we avoid malfunctions of the various weapons on board. If one of our shard launchers misfires, we run a high probability of missing a gib. The 5F weapon stabilizer is the magic sauce that makes this whole build possible. It's required equipment, but is thankfully very easy to find. Our two remaining unrestricted size 5 optional internals will receive a 5D and 5E Guardian module reinforcement package. This combination balances module protection with longevity. Both these internals can be repaired by the field maintenance unit with much higher speed than a normal internal module when accepting damage from weapons fire. Note that overheat damage can bypass this protection to harm modules directly. Our one military restricted optional internal and three size four internals will be hull reinforcement packages with heavy duty engineering and deep plating experimental effects. If you plan on salvaging Thargoid hearts during combat, you will need a caustic resistant cargo rack to safely hold them. A size 4 optional can be replaced with one of these racks if desired. The remaining size 1 and size 2 optional internals hold an advanced docking computer and supercruise assist for convenience and comfort. These can be substituted for anything you want. The weapons package will be size 2 modified guardian shard cannons courtesy of Salvation. These ridiculously powerful weapons are very easy to use. Regular shard cannons can be substituted if you don't have access to the Salvation variants. These actually do more damage than the mod shard, but have less range. Be sure to use size 3 standard shard cannons where they fit if you are using the standard variants. For a gib to be effective, you need all the weapons to be on a single fire group with a fully loaded magazine firing in sync. If any of the weapons have less than a full mag, you will need to cycle at least that weapon. This can be done by turning all the other ones off, or by doing a full firing cycle of all weapons. If any weapon is low, you might not deal enough damage to secure the gib kill. Firing this many weapons so quickly generates tremendous amounts of heat. To manage this heat, we're going to load up six of our utility slots with heat sinks. The serious large capacity heat sink is the ideal choice here, but any heat sink can work, though you are sacrificing combat endurance with any other sink. This is because our weapons package is wholly reliant on these heat sinks to control temperatures enough to keep working. Without effective cooling, these hardpoints will rapidly cease to function. Our remaining utility mounts are reserved for an anti-Xeno scanner and shutdown field neutralizer. Essential kit for any AX-focused ship, though with a nuance. Be sure to mount the scanner and neutralizer on the bow of the Anaconda. Heat sinks discharge a very bright flare when they cycle. This flare can be very distracting when it shoots up vertically through your weapon sights during combat, so they do best on the keel or behind the ship's bridge. Power management is organized as follows. By design, we voluntarily sacrifice the weapon systems to keep the ship from fully shutting down during critical power plant malfunctions. We also leave the FSD at a higher priority than the thrusters 
to preserve high wake spools in emergency situations. Our budget is meaty, but there are still more expensive ships than this. We sit just north of 500 million without discounts, making this a late game ship for experienced players. The engineering load is likewise significant, requiring a number of pre-engineered tech brokers and guardian kits to fully develop. It's a long grind to make this beast work, but once it is working, 100 mil per hour earnings at a station defense zone is not difficult with some practice. Speaking of which, the flight characteristics of this build are typical of an anaconda, that is, slow, lumbering, weighty, but tough for its size and shape. The long, slender hull profile keeps hardpoint centered, making aiming uncomplicated, though occasionally time-consuming. The Instagib weapons array is only effective against Cyclops interceptors. A basilisk or higher will need to follow the normal combat process for at least the first two hearts. You can add premium synthesis to each weapon magazine to potentially overcome this, though I wasn't willing to part with that much engineering material for this test. You are going to need assistance to manage the aggression of interceptors higher than a cyclops. Group combat is highly recommended for any engagement involving high-level interceptors, as this build lacks the defensive endurance to manage that amount of incoming damage for very long. You should think of yourself as a glass cannon in that regard. The process to safely fire this many mod shards is a little more complicated than normal. Because of the amount of heat each individual weapon produces, shots have to be carefully timed for maximum effect and paired with heatsink charges. You'll need all five volleys from the weapons array to make full contact with the hull of a Cyclops interceptor, or the gib won't work. To do this, ensure your weapon capacitor is fully charged, and that all four pit markers are full. Ensure you have at least two heatsink charges ready. The best way to do this is with the fire heatsink keybind, as it will automatically cycle through available heatsinks without taking up space on your fire groups. As the target comes into range, I find 1.5 kilometers works best, drop two heatsink charges before firing. Once a shot is aligned, dump the magazines from all six weapons as quickly as you can. Even if you start to miss, continue to fire until the weapons reload. This will keep them synchronized, ensuring all the available damage is applied correctly on the next volley. Ship heat will still spike well into the overtemp range, but with two heat sinks active, temperatures will rapidly return to safe levels. Some internal damage will occur with each volley, but with good timing, the weapons array will be able to kill several cyclopses before individual weapons begin to misfire. The automatic field maintenance unit can be used to conduct field repairs without landing. If you are attentive during breaks in combat, it's possible to repair damage to the weapons array between engagements. This process takes about two minutes, with a few weapons below 80% integrity. You can also land at an available starport for repairs once these malfunctions begin to occur. Note that an effective gib is dependent on all hardpoints working correctly at all times. Any malfunction in any weapon greatly increases the likelihood of a failed gib. Be aggressive with maintenance and repairs, or risk losing your ship. The feel of this ship in combat is something unique, providing a ton of opportunity for synergy with other ships. The Thunderhammer build struggles to deal with scouts, leaving plenty of room for a Type 10 to join in a tag team formation. The Anaconda isn't much faster than a Type 10, so this pair-up makes sense. Add traditional anti-interceptor medium ships to clean up high-level interceptors, and you have the makings of a wing that can handle just about any threat with ease. Note that at time of writing, Coriolis still has not updated to reflect the latest weapons available. This includes things like the mod shard and weapon stabilizers. As a result, this tool is not currently providing accurate build metrics. Pay close attention to your in-game outfitting screen as you set things up. That's all I have for today.